Our great God, our Heavenly Father, our Creator, we pray to You. We are Your creatures, we are Your creation. We are not in charge of You. We don't get to tell You what to do, what to say, how to think, how to act. Our job is to worship You. And as Clint said earlier, we are to worship you in spirit and truth. We are to respond to your, to your revelation in an appropriate manner. The manner that you have given us in your word. A manner with a heart of submission, a heart of humility, a heart of love. And also we are to do it in accordance with your word. In accordance with with the truth that you have blessed us with. I pray now that you may guide us by your truth, guide us by your word, the scriptures, the word that came from you, is about you. I just pray that it may change our hearts, change our minds, so we may, we may be better worshippers after this service than we were before. We thank you that you have given us your truth, an inerrant truth, an authoritative truth, infallible truth, sufficient truth. And we pray that we may respond to it appropriately this morning. Help us to be transformed more into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ, the one who came to save us from our sins. We thank you that through faith and repentance, faith in Jesus Christ, by trusting in Him alone, we can have a right relationship with You and we can worship You appropriately. Enlarge our understanding of who You are and who Your Son is, what You are doing, what Your Son is doing and what You will do, what Your Son will do. Enlarge our understanding of that this morning through Your Word, the Word that came from You, inspired by Your Spirit. And may your spirit mold us as we've already prayed. More into the image of your Son. Guide us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, Robert Murray McShane was a minister in the Church of Scotland in the mid-19th century. McShane was born in Edinburgh to Adam and Lockhart McShane as well as, and he was well educated by these parents throughout his time with them, even from an early age. McShane at the age of four knew the characters of the Greek alphabet. He was able to sing and recite fluently. And this good education that came from his parents kept going on until he reached university. After matriculating, he entered the University of Edinburgh, whereby he still excelled there and he distinguished himself as an academic at this institution. But despite being an academic, McShane at this time did not have a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. But McShane was often the subject of his older brother's prayers, in which his older brother was praying for McShane's salvation. And God did eventually answer his brother's prayers, but only after his brother died, in an early, by, in an early death by a stroke. And it was his brother's death that sparked McShane to take life a bit more seriously, and to ponder about death, ponder about life. And so in light of taking life more seriously, he decided he needs to be, needs to be sitting under an evangelical ministry whereby he can learn these truths. And it was through him sitting under a certain ministry that he came to saving faith. Not too soon after that, McShane then had a desire to enter the ministry himself, to help other people as he was helped. And so he entered the Divinity Hall of the university, and under the leadership of some faithful men, there became a new stir of spiritual life in the college during his time. This stir, led by McShane, would soon 
be brought to the rest of Scotland. On the 29th of March, 1835, he finished his schooling. And he wrote in his diary that day, he said this in his diary, College finished on Friday, my last appearance there. Life is vanishing fast, make haste for eternity. McShane was ready to fulfill what he believed God had laid upon his heart. He was ready to go and help people, help people know who God is, know who Jesus Christ was. His goal was to tell people about Jesus and those who already knew Jesus, help them become more like Jesus. One author writes at the end of his time at the Divinity Hall, so ended his preparatory discipline, both of heart and mind. His soul was prepared for the awful work of ministry by much prayer and much study of the Word of God. By inward trials, by experience of the depth of corruption in his own heart, and by discoveries of the Savior's fullness of grace. It was several months later that he was ordained as a minister of St. Peter's Church in Dundee in Scotland. It was a new church in a rather difficult town. One author says this church was built in a sadly neglected district containing some 4,000 souls. Not a big place. McShane himself records about this city. He said this city is given to idolatry and hardness of heart. He called it a very dead region. And there was nothing in McShane's gospel that pleased these people. But McShane knew and he said, if the gospel pleased carnal men, it would not be the gospel. And so he continued to preach in a small town that did not really like him. And some were saved through his ministry. Some were saved through his preaching. But something happened very soon into his ministry. McShane began to suffer heart issues during his time as a pastor in this small town, severe heart issues, so much so that he had to step down from the ministry. His medical advisor said, you must cease from all work, lest you die. And so with deep regrets, McShane returned to his parents' home in Edinburgh with the goal to rest until he was well enough to go back to the ministry. During his time of rest, he often wrote to his church, preaching to them in his letters, teaching them in his letters. However, McShane was not getting better. So in the spring of 1839, a group of other ministers told McShane, why don't you come with us to Israel? Join us in a journey to Israel. There is a ministry work you can help us with there. And not only that, the weather in Israel will be better for you, for your body, than the weather in Scotland. So he embarked upon the journey. And the journey went fine, but the problem was on his way back. On his way home, after the trip, he became dangerously ill again. Towards the end of July 1839, as he lay dying near Smyrna, he believed it was not his native Scotland, but to his eternal home that he was going. However, God spared him that time, and he was able to return to Scotland in November that year. But he returned to a different church. When he was there, the church was, was strong, but it was new. But when he returned, he returned to a church that was full of spiritual activity, full of spiritual life. What had happened was his teaching and his life had a profound impact upon this church and this town, even in his absence. However, soon after, he fell ill again, but this time he knew this was the end. He said to his church, I do not expect to live long. He said, changes are coming. Every eye before me shall soon be dim in death. Another pastor shall feed this flock. Another singer lead the psalm. Another flock shall fill this fold. There is no believing, no repenting, no conversion in the grave. No minister will speak to you there. This is the time of conversion. O oh, my friends, you will have no ordinances in hell. There will be no preaching in hell. O oh, that you would use this little time. Every moment of, its, of it is worth a world. In his final sermons, he preached a lot about eternity. In February 1843, a month before he died, he preached 27 times in 24 different places, often traveling through heavy snow. On his return to Dundee, he confessed that he felt very tired from all this work. Then on his final sermon on March 12th, he preached from Romans chapter 9, verses 22 to 23, whereby the Apostle Paul writes, what if God, although willing to demonstrate His wrath and to make His power known, 
endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. And he did so to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory. His final sermon was a sermon about God's sovereignty, knowing that his time was coming to an end. On that Tuesday, he felt ill, but he did a wedding service. Nonetheless, after the wedding service, he went and spoke to a group of children at an event, telling them, telling them about the great shepherd. Later that week, he succumbed to a fever for many days. During this time, he suffered various hallucinations. But even in his, even in his delirious mind, he was still trying to preach to his people. He said in this bed, even when he was high with fevers, he said, you must be awakened in time or you'll be awakened in everlasting torment to your eternal confusion. Then on Saturday, March 25th, 1843, he died at the age of 29. A man on fire for God. A man who did much for God in a short span. He died before he was 30. And so many people are left with several questions. But there's at least one question we must ask about this. Was Robert Murray McShane's ministry successful? Some would say, how could it be? For God took him so young, how could it be successful? He must have been dishonoring God. But the problem with that thinking, it's not based on Christianity, that's more based on Buddhism. That's some cup of karma. And also it has a skewed problem, a skewed thinking, or understanding of success in ministry. Success in ministry is not about the results, even though there were results. But success in ministry is about the faithfulness of the man or the woman. Success in ministry, success in life, success as a Christian, is dependent upon one's faithfulness to the Scriptures. It's not about a long life filled with few trials. Success in the Christianity or success in ministry is not about having a large church with a big paycheck. You can be a horrible pastor and have a large church and a big paycheck. Success in ministry, success in being a pastor is when a man is faithful to the task of shepherding God's people. And to that, McShane was certainly a success. Just listen to some of the words of McShane himself. He knew what it meant to be a successful minister. And during his time in ministry, he often encouraged other ministers to the same faithfulness. And once he encourages other pastors with these words, he said to him, Above all things, cultivate your own spirit. Your own soul is your first and greatest care. Seek advance of personal holiness. And he has a famous quote by his, It is not great talents that God blesses so much as great likeness to Jesus. A holy minister is an awful weapon in the hand of God. A word spoken by you when your conscience is clear and your heart full of God's Spirit is worth 10,000 words spoken in unbelief and sin. Get your texts from God, your thoughts from God, and your words from God. To McShane, success in ministry was being more like Jesus. It was about being faithful to Jesus' words in the Scriptures. About being faithful to live by them and faithful to teach them. A concept which we shall see in our text this morning. So if you will, you can turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4, we'll be looking at verses 12 through 16. As you know, we've been studying this book, 1 Timothy, going through it verse by verse. A book about the church. And three weeks ago, we were looking at verses 6 to 11 in 1 Timothy 4. And in those verses, the Apostle Paul told his young protege, protege Timothy about what it means to be a successful pastor. And we compared what the Scriptures say to what the world says success is. But the Scriptures have a different understanding of success. In verses 6 through 11, we learned that the successful pastor warns his flock against dangers. He bleeds the Bible. He is theological. He avoids worldly ideas. He focuses on his godliness. He places his hope in God and he preaches with authority. Paul said, if you want to be a good servant of Jesus Christ, this is what it looks like. And so today we're going to continue what Paul said about a good servant of Jesus Christ, about a successful pastor. We're going to see five more aspects 
of what it means to be a successful pastor. So let's read the text, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 12 through um, 16. The Apostle Paul writes, Let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself an example of those who believe. Until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and teaching. Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was bestowed on you through prophetic utterance with the laying on of hands by the presbytery. Take pains with these things, be absorbed in them, so that your progress will be evident to all. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things, for as you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. And like I said, from this text we're going to see five more aspects of what it means to be a successful pastor. If you're looking to become a pastor yourself, or if you're looking to join a church with a faithful pastor, here are five more aspects of what to look for. And also these aspects are going to hopefully encourage you in your own Christian walk. Whether you're a pastor, whether you will be one, or whether you never will be one. We're going to see that the successful pastor, he's an example to his church. The second aspect we will see is that the successful pastor leads his church by the word. The successful pastor utilizes his gifts. The successful pastor's growth is evident to all. And the successful pastor has the right priorities. Let's begin with the first one. The successful pastor is an example to his church. Let's look at verse 12 again. Paul says to Timothy, Let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself an example of those who believe. And so what we see in verse 12, there are two commands in verse 12. There's a negative one and a positive one. Timothy, if you want to be a successful pastor, if you want to be, as we saw last time in verse 6 says, a good servant of Jesus Christ, then first, you need to let no one look down on your youthfulness, Timothy. This is the first command. And this is the negative one. Let no one look down on your youthfulness. The word look down is what we call an imperative or a command. It's what Timothy is. It's what Paul is not. He's, Paul's not suggesting this to Timothy. He's telling this to Timothy. Don't let anyone look, let, look down on your youthfulness. This is something Paul wants Timothy to do, to aim for. Timothy, as you minister in Ephesus, the city where Timothy was, you're going to encounter a problem. You're going to have a problem. What problem? The problem of your age, Timothy. Your age is going to be a barrier to people in the city, people in this church, especially in this Greek culture that you're living in that elevates the age philosophers of the day. Without a long life, you're not going to have a long track record to earn respect. No, Timothy, because you're young, you're going to have to earn this respect differently. But how was... Well, how, well, the first question we want to ask is this. How, how old was Timothy now during this time? No, we cannot be sure. Obviously, being youthful is subjective. Someone who's 40 can be youthful to someone who's 80. But what we do know is that Paul first met Timothy in Acts chapter 16, verse 1 at Lystra. And that was around the years 80, 49 to 80, 50. And if you remember in our first sermon, I argued that this letter was probably written around 80, 62 to 64. Therefore, the time between when Paul first met Timothy and when he wrote this letter to Timothy, at its earliest is probably 12 years, and its latest, 15 years. And when Paul initially met Timothy in Acts 16, Timothy was already well spoken by the Christians who lived in both Lystra and in another nearby town, Iconium. So he probably wasn't too young at that time to be well known in two different cities. So I think it's reasonable, obviously you can't be 100% sure of this, I think it's reasonable to conclude that Timothy is probably in his mid-30s to early 40s when Paul writes to him here. Even though that doesn't sound very youthful, it did to many people in Ephesus who were elevating the age philosophers. And this became a hindrance to Timothy's ministry. So Timothy has this age problem. But Paul wants him to overcome this age problem. That's a tall order. How do you overcome an age problem? 
You can simply wait. But for how long? Waiting wasn't Paul's answer. For Paul didn't leave Timothy without a solution to his age problem. The answer to your age problem, Timothy, is the answer. There's a solution to it. The answer, Timothy, is for you to be a godly person in your church. A godly example to these people. Your age is not going to give you the respect and trust you need for the ministry. But that can be overcome through your personal walk with Jesus Christ. Through your holiness, through your godliness. Timothy, you might not have the years of experience that this church wants from you. But you're going to bypass that problem by having the necessary qualifications of what it takes to be a pastor, of being a pastor. You don't have the time and so you need the godly qualifications. Which in light, which in light of what we learned in chapter 3 um, is, more, is more important than time. Current godly credentials always outweigh time spent in ministry. Because age doesn't automatically equal wisdom and godliness. It doesn't. It should, but it doesn't. But you, Timothy, will overcome the age problem by being the best follower of Jesus Christ. That's what we see in the next part of the verse. But, Paul says, this, this but is, is a strong Greek uh, word, meaning is a very strong contrast here. So on the one hand, don't let do this, but on the other hand, you must do this, but do that. Let no one look down on your youthfulness, but instead do this. But rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself an example of those who believe. What you need to do, Timothy, is show yourself an example to these believers. Show them that you are a godly man. Show them by your life that you imitate Jesus Christ. The phrase, show yourself, tells us that the onus is on Timothy to do this. So while Timothy, you can't help your age, you can help this. You're responsible for this. And this show yourself is another imperative, another command by Paul. You must do this, Timothy. Not a suggestion. This is how your ministry will work. Ministry functions on godly men inspiring others to follow their example so that they too can become more godly. And we see this principle throughout the New Testament, especially from the Apostle Paul. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 16, Therefore I exhort you, be imitators of me. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1, Be imitators of me, just as I also am of Christ. Philippians 3 17, Brethren, join in following my example, and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. Philippians 4 verse 9, The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. And Hebrews 13 verse 7, Remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you, and considering the result of their conduct, imitate their faith. The quality of a mature Christian is that those less mature than him or her can imitate that godly Christian with the result that the more immature person becomes more godly, more mature. And this is especially true for church leadership, for ministry. Church leaders being an example to the flock is pivotal to the establishment of any healthy church. It is often said that church can only go high as its pastors. Ungodly pastors are usually not going to produce godly people. Even though the godliness is coming from God, the example of the ungodliness is going to infiltrate the people in the pews. John MacArthur, he writes, Setting an example of godly living that others can follow is a sine qua non of excellence in ministry. When a manifest pattern of godliness is missing, the power is drained out of preaching, leaving it a hollow, empty shell. A minister's life is his most powerful message and must reinforce what he says, or he may as well not say it. Authoritative preaching is undermined if there is not a virtuous life backing it up. Preachers are meant to exhort their listeners to more holiness. But Matthew 7 teaches us against hypocritical judgment. And what that means is, is that the preacher is living in blatant disregard of what he preaches. He is a hypocrite. It doesn't mean he's perfect, but if he, like I said, if he lives in blatant disregard of, of the text, how can he exhort other people to follow it? 
How can a preacher tell the men in the church to love their wives when he is addicted to pornography, enslaved to it? How can a preacher tell the church to be faithful stewards of what God has given you when he is enslaved to gambling? It's hypocrisy, and hypocrisy will not cut it in the ministry. It will not cut it in the Christian life, let alone the ministry. Hypocrisy makes you a bad example to follow. Now it is true that the preacher's sermons will always far outpace his life. But the preacher still needs to be striving for holiness, for without which the scriptures say no one will see the Lord. And Paul specifically lists certain areas that Timothy can prove to be a godly example in. First, his speech. Timothy, if you want to earn respect by your godliness, you must show yourself an example of godliness by the way you talk, by your speech, by your words. Avoid lying, avoid gossip, avoid flattery, avoid slander, avoid errant teaching. And instead embrace truthfulness, embrace encouragement, embrace edification, embrace sound teaching. Ephesians 4.29 Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth. But only such a word is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Second Timothy, show yourself an, an example by your conduct, by the way you live, the way you live your life in whatever situation you find yourself in. Whether you're at the shop, whether you're at the bank, whether you're at the government place, wherever you are, even home affairs, you need to show yourself an example in your conduct. 1 Peter 2 verse 12, keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. 3 Timothy, show yourself an example by your love. Now the biblical definition of love is very different from the worldly definition. The worldly definition of love is to make much of someone no matter what. But biblical love makes much of God and is sacrificial. John 15 verse 13, Jesus said, Greater love is no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. Timothy, you will earn respect when people see both your sacrificial love for God and your sacrificial love for your neighbor. Even when they don't reciprocate the love, you will earn respect as a godly minister are you still loving them? Fourth, show yourself an example in faith, Timothy. Now this is not the faith referring to the scriptures, but this text is simply referring to how Timothy ought to trust in God. Show yourself an example in your trusting of God and your faith there. Is your faith strong, Timothy? You will earn respect in your church by the way you trust God. The more you do it, even in, in, in adversity, the more you'll be respected, despite your age. And then fifth, Timothy, show yourself an example in purity. In purity. One final area I want to specifically remind you of, Timothy, is if you want to be respected, people need to see you as one who pursues purity, who avoids sexual immorality. People won't trust you, Timothy. People won't respect you if you are known as a womanizer. Therefore, Timothy, if you want to be a good servant of Jesus Christ, if you want to be truly successful in your ministry, be an example to those in your church. And that takes us to the second aspect. The successful pastor leads his church by the word. By the word. Now back in my, I think it was my first semester at the Master's Seminary in Los Angeles, I had this assignment I had to do. This assignment was very simple. Go to another church, it's not your home church, and just go and evaluate what they do in the service. Write down what they do. And all we had to do was just write up an order of service to see what they do. So I decided to go to this mega church and just wrote down their order of service. And here's my report on my perceived order of service at the Real Life Church in Valencia, California on the 25th of October 2015. So here's the order of service they have there. First thing, there was a song. I think it was a heavy rock song. That's what I wrote here. Some form of heavy rock song. Uh, second thing they did was a song. It was a Hillsong United song. Uh, third, there was, uh, there was a short interlude of prayer. 
Fourth, another song I think I wrote here, a hill, I think it's a Hillsong song. Fifth, there was a communion reminder speech. Sixth, prayer for communion. Seventh was communion or the Lord's table. Eighth, they had a video of some event that took place the previous day. Ninth, they prayed for the offering. Tenth, they did the offering. Eleventh, they welcomed new people. Twelfth, they had a second video for, of some people in the church. Thirteenth, uh, there was a presentation of upcoming events. Fourteenth was the pastor's sermon. Fifteenth, there was a third video of the church of what it does. Sixteenth, there was a fourth video of one of the church members. And seventeenth, there was a closing prayer. And so my evaluation of the service, I organized this liturgy, as you would call it, into percentages. And out of my evaluation of the service, only about 5% of the service had something to do with the Bible. Uh, while videos took up 50 over 50% of the service, and they weren't even about you know, the Bible or anything like that. But now compare this evaluation to what Paul once emphasized by a successful pastor in the church. Remember, this is how Timothy is going to be a good servant of Jesus Christ. So look at verse 13. Until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and teaching. So Paul begins this verse with the phrase, until I come. In other words, Timothy, this is what I want you to be doing while I'm gone. While I'm gone, focus on these things. Focus on these things. So what must Timothy focus on, or as Paul says, give attention to? Three things. Reading Scripture, preaching Scripture, and teaching Scripture. You want to be a good servant of Jesus Christ? Then emphasize these three things in your service. The word give attention is again, it's a command, an imperative. It's not a suggestion. The word refers to occupying oneself with something, or devoting oneself to something. The first thing, Timothy... You need to occupy yourself or devote yourself with in your church is the public reading of scripture the phrase is literally the reading that's what just literally just says if you have a new american standard bible you will notice that the words public and scripture are in italics indicating that those words aren't in the original greek but they're implied by the context because like i said the phrase is literally the reading but since the practice of the early synagogues and the early church was the reading of the scriptures, and since Paul uses a definite article, the, to refer to reading, it's the reading, and since this is a letter about the church, then this, then this is about reading the scriptures in the church. That's why the Bible's, your versions say that. About reading the scriptures in the church service. And like I said, the practice of reading the scriptures was prevalent in both the synagogues of Jesus' day, and the period of the early church. Think about Jesus in Luke chapter 4, verse 16 to 19, when he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath, and he stood and read, read from the book of Isaiah. The apostle James also mentioned this in Acts 15, verse 21, when he said, For Moses from ancient generations has in every city those who preach him, since he is read in the synagogues every Sabbath. Or think of how the Apostle Paul often wanted his, his uh, letters to be read in churches. He wrote to the Thessalonians, he said in the first Thessalonians 5.27, he said, I adjure you by the Lord to have this letter read to all the brethren. The bottom line is that churches ought to have times whereby there is the scriptures being read. Whether it's the Old or the New Testament, the Bible must be read. Because there's no other time in the service... If a good translation is being used, whereby God is most assuredly speaking. Because the sermon could be terrible. The songs could be theologically incorrect. But if at the same time there's someone's reading from a good translation of the Bible, at least there people are hearing from God. I remember one friend saying to me that the, the way he subjectively evaluates a church... It's simply whether they read the Bible or not in the service. If you want to be a good servant of Jesus Christ, Timothy, read the scriptures in your church. Give attention to it. Devote time to it. It's not a waste of time, but critical to the functioning of a healthy church. But Paul also wants Timothy to focus on something else. He's, look at the text. He says, you know, give attention also to the exhortation. The word 
emphasizes exhortation, a type of teaching whereby one is urged to obey. Another way of describing this is preaching. For preaching is not merely the imparting of information, but preaching involves taking the meaning of a text and exhorting the hearers to obey the meaning, to obey what God has said. Churches ought to have sermons in it, have preaching in them, and the pulpit ought to be a main part of the service. Why? Because that's what's emphasized in the Bible, in the New Testament. We see the sermon emphasized much in the worship service in the New Testament. That is why traditionally in Protestant churches, the pulpit at the center of the church, as it's different in Roman Catholic churches where the altar is in the center of the church, because to them, to them the mass is the most important, whilst Protestants have traditionally emphasized the preaching. The exhortation or the preaching of a service is essential. It is where the congregation will most likely change, obviously, if it's a good preaching, faithful preaching. And thus it's a vital component of a church. The English Puritan Presbyterian minister, John Flavel, he says this about preaching. It is not with us preachers as with other laborers. They find their work as they leave it, so do not we. Sin and Satan unravel almost all we do. The impressions we make on people's souls in one sermon vanish before the next. And if that is true, then we ought to ensure that we continue to bring solid sermons to the people week by week. Timothy, if you want to be a good servant of Jesus Christ, then focus on exhortation. Focus on preaching in your church. And then one more thing, Timothy, you must give attention to until I come, is the teaching. I want you to simply teach your church. Teach them the scriptures. Tell them about the doctrines that we see in the Bible. Teach them theology. And in other words, churches ought to be also places of learning. Specifically learning the Bible and learning about the great truth of the Bible. We ought to have sermons flooded with theology and scripture. We ought to have Bible studies where we actually study the Bible. We ought to sing songs that teach theology, not merely songs that stir up our emotions superficially. Timothy, if you want to be a good servant of Jesus Christ, if you want to have a healthy church, you must read the word, preach the word, and teach the word. Now, I don't know if many of you remember this, but early in the, in, it was big in the early 2000s. There was a movement called the Emergent Church that was kind of big, came on the scene. The movement believed that the modern church had departed from its early roots and thus needed to go back to its foundation in order to be, in order to be faithful. And based on that definition, that's good. That sounds like exactly what happened to the Reformation. And it sounds good until you saw what they actually meant. To the emergent church, preaching, teaching, and reading, reading the scriptures were addendums that church history added to the church. And in light of that, since they believed that those items were extra baggage in a church service, they believed you must get rid of all those things and promote, the, and promote other things. They emphasized getting rid of pulpits, getting rid of church buildings, getting rid of traditional songs. They blamed everyone. They blamed Constantine. They blamed uh, capitalism. They blamed the Enlightenment. They blamed the fundamentalists. They blamed everyone. And considering this, we are told by these people that we need to be more sacramental, more liturgical, more mystical. We ought to, as one art author writes, light candles, burn incense, celebrate the arts, foster community, and avoid conventional church structures, especially preaching. We are told that we need to meet in houses and not in church buildings. And again, cut down on the preaching. We see this from people like Robert Weber, Brian McLaren, Wolfgang Simpson, Frank Viola, George Barner, and many more. And they all of them emphasize the move away from preaching and teaching towards mysticism. The way of the ancient church, supposedly. However, that's not what we see in the early church. We see what the Apostle Paul writes here. Both in the church we see in Scripture, and even the church that took place right after Scripture... You see that just off the time of the apostles, the, the churches there were still doing what we see in the Bible. We're still doing what we're doing right here. One example is Justin Martyr. He was he, or he was a, an early Christian pastor who lived in the hundreds. And pretty soon after the New Testament was written, he was having a church service. And he actually recorded what happened in this church service. So compare what the real early church did to what these guys are saying the early church did. So Justin Martyr, he said this, on the day called Sunday, there's a gathering together. The memos of the apostles or the writings of the prophets are read, as long as time permits. Then when the reader ceases, the pastor in the discourse 
admonishes and urges the imitation of these good things. So read the scriptures, preach the scriptures. Next, we all rise together and send up prayer, so we pray. When we cease from prayer, bread is presented and wine and water, so there's the Lord's table. The pastor, in the same manner, sends up prayers and thanksgivings according to his ability. The people sing out their assent, saying the Amen, so they're singing. A distribution and participation of the elements for which thanks have been given is made to each person. And to those who are not present, they are sent by the deacons, so there's deacons there. Those who have means and are willing, each according to his own choice, gives what he wills, and what is collected is disposited with the pastor, so there's giving there happening. He provides for the orphans and widows, those who are in need on account of sickness or some other cause, those who are in bonds, strangers who are sojourning, and in the word he becomes a protector of all who are in need. So there's community activism there. It's not very mystical, is it? It's not very mystical. We see reading, we see preaching, we see praying, we see the Lord's Supper, we see songs, we see giving. Why did they do all this? Because they went to the Word of God and said, that's what's there, let's do the same. And that's what we do today. And so the successful pastor leads his church by the Word. And that takes us to the third aspect, the successful pastor utilizes his gifts. Let's read verse 14. Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was bestowed on you through the prophetic utterance with the laying on of hands by the presbytery. Now many churches, many denominations have what we call an ordination. What is an ordination? Well, the modern definition of ordination is the investiture of clergy or the act of granting pastoral authority or sacerdotal power. It is when a church publicly recognizes an individual for church leadership. And many churches do this in different ways. But a lot, of, a lot of the modern concept of ordination actually comes from texts like this one. And even though a lot of what modern churches do with ordination are pretty foreign to what we see in this text, we nevertheless see that there's some type of recognition that someone is, is fit for the ministry. Let's break down the text. Paul begins with a negative command, do not neglect. This is emphasized in the Greek text. This is what Paul wants Timothy to take extra note of. This negative command, Timothy, do not neglect. Neglect what? Don't neglect the spiritual gift within you, Timothy. So what gift is Paul speaking about here? The gift Paul is speaking about here is the gift or gifts that have been given to all Christians, as we see in the New Testament. We see the concept of what we know as spiritual gifts. What's a spiritual gift? Well, you'll hear many different definitions surrounding this. Here's my definition. It's quite loaded. Spiritual gifts are specific gifts which are given to Christians by God to effectively serve other Christians for the edification and strength done with love and an orderly manner for the growth of the local body of believers and for the glory of God. That's my definition. All Christians have them. That's what we see in the scriptures. All Christians have been given a special gift. It doesn't mean all Christians have the same one, but God has sovereignly given Certain Christians, certain gifts, which God deems will be best for that church. The scriptures have several lists of these gifts. And in these lists we see gifts like service and teaching and faith and giving and, and helps and more. So when Paul's referring to Timothy's gift that he mustn't neglect, he's referring to one or more of those gifts we see listed in scripture. So which gifts is Paul speaking about? Well, we can at least presume... Gifts that surround ministry, I think that's a good presumption, such as the gift of you know, pastoring, preaching, teaching. And what Paul is doing is he's telling Timothy to not neglect these gifts that God has given you. Don't waste them. Timothy, you have been gifted by God, and if you want to be a successful pastor, then utilize those gifts. Spend your time in them. Don't try to be other people. Be you. Be the Christian that God has called you to be with the specific gifts that he gave you. So too many pastors often spend their time majoring on the minors. No, Timothy, focus on what God has gifted you to do. Don't spend all your time doing the things that everyone else can do, that everyone else has been gifted to do. Focus on what God has called you to do. I've used this analogy before. It's like a hospital hiring a doctor. What work are they going to make the doctor do? They're going to make him be a secretary? No. He's, he's going to do a doctoral job. It's not that being a secretary is a bad job or below the doctor. Those jobs, the, the secretary is vital to the survival of a hospital. But the hospital...
hospital hired a doctor to do doctor work. If he's not doing doctoral work, he'll be wasting the special skills that he has. And the hospital wouldn't function properly, wouldn't be effective. People primarily come to a hospital, hospital to see a doctor, not the secretary. The secretary is functional to them seeing the doctor, but they came to see the doctor. It's the same with the pastor. He must focus on what is that which is his primary task, utilize his unique gifts that God has given him. And then Paul reminds Timothy about a time when the spiritual gifts were recognized by the elders. He says, Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was bestowed on you through prophetic utterance with the laying on of hands by the presbytery. What is clear from this text is that the presbytery is simply a word that refers to the elders. It's a presbyteros. And it refers to elders. If you remember when we learned about a pastor in 1 Timothy 3 verse 1, he is also an elder. So he has a group of elders. And what is also clear is that they didn't give Timothy this gift, contrary to what some people will teach. People cannot give you spiritual gifts. You're not God. Hence why Paul mentions Timothy's gifts coming, not from man, but by, but by God through God's prophetic utterances. Objectively, it came from God, and subjectively, it was recognized by these elders. Publicly recognized. And the way that publicly recognizes was through their laying on of hands. Nothing mystical here. There's not some superpower coming from their hands. They're not Iron Man or something like that. Just them publicly showing everyone by laying on their hands that this person is set aside for ministry. And so if you want to be successful, if you want to be a good servant of Jesus Christ, don't neglect your gift, Timothy. Fourth, the successful pastor's growth is evident to all. Many years back, I remember applying for this pastoral position at this one church. I can't remember where it actually was. It was uh, many years back. It was in the U.S. when I was living there. Um, I remember applying at it, and then what happens with these churches, you apply, and you hear nothing forever, and then eventually you hear something. Someone decides to contact you, and I did receive a reply, and part of the reply was this question. He said, if you have had a chance to look at our documents on the church's website, you probably have noticed that we have a Wesleyan background. Do you think that would be a problem to work with? Whoops. I didn't see that on their documents. My bad, it is a problem. Now, I don't know what they meant by a background of Wesleyanism, but Wesleyan doctrines are very different for several reasons. But one reason is that many Wesleyans, obviously not all, but many of them, believe in what is called entire sanctification. This doctrine believes that Christians can become sinless in this life. They're entirely sanctified. They've done the walk. They've achieved it. And you can see that's a problem. Because if they're entirely sanctified, they should be teaching me. Because I'm nowhere near that. But we know the scriptures don't teach this. 1 John 1 verse 8 says, If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. And the truth is not in us. See, that doesn't square well with Wesleyism. And neither does our text. What we shall see now is that for a pastor to be successful... It's not that he must be perfect, but that he must be mature. He must be progressing in his maturity, growing. Look at verse 15. Take pains with these things, be absorbed in them, so that your progress will be evident to all. The verse begins with the word, take pains with these things. The phrase, take pains, can refer to studying or cultivating or practicing something. What must the pastor, what must Timothy be taking pains to do? These things, or what are these things? Well, we can assume these things are the things Paul has just told Timothy about, like his godliness, his teaching, etc., etc. Timothy, cultivate these things. And to double it up, be absorbed in them. Or literally be in them. Another imperative, another command. These things I've been telling you about, Timothy, they're important. They ought to take up your time. They ought to be your priority. The ministry work, Timothy, is hard work. You've got to be absorbed in things. You've got to be studying hard. Take pains with these things. One author, Kent Hughes, he says this, There is simply no success in ministry apart from hard work. I know that workaholism is a sin, and I guard myself and all my colleagues against it. But as I travel around the country to speak at ministers' conferences, I find that the greatest problem is sloth, and especially in regard to the pulpit. Many do not spend enough time to prepare and teach a good Sunday school lesson, let alone preach effectively. 
In fact, the fare is often better in Sunday school. One lazy preacher prepared the sermon on Saturday nights while watching television. Presumably, the Bible was not enough to occupy his mind. The predictable corollary is that his preaching also did not occupy his congregation's thoughts or hearts. That is scandalous, given the force of Paul's advice here and the rest of the apostorals. The ministry is hard work, Timothy. You've got to take pains in it. You've got to be absorbed in it. And you need to work hard and do it. And you work hard only for many in the church, Timothy, to think you don't work at all. A one-hour work week. My response is, have you ever thought of how much an Olympic sprinter has to work? And he works 10 seconds every four years. It's a better job. The point is, is a lot of work is in the preparation, like the sprinter. A good chef prepares his food beforehand. When you travel around in the U.S., you can go to many barbecue restaurants. And when you order their meat, like the smoked brisket, it tastes good. But why does it taste good? It wasn't microwaved. And the reason why it tastes good is it's been sitting in the smoker for 16 hours, or even more sometimes. It was thoroughly prepared and the result is evident. The same is true for work in the ministry. When you work hard, people will see the results. Why must Timothy take pains in these things? Why must he be absorbed in these things? So that, so that is the reason or the purpose for what he's just said. So that your progress will be evident to all. What happens when you take pains in your godliness, what happens when you're absorbed in your preaching and teaching, what happens when you work hard in the ministry, it's that people will, it, what happens is that you will grow in your walk with Jesus, and then other people will notice it. The successful past is one whereby people can see him growing. The word is progress, not perfect, but going upward. The successful past is one whereby the congregation can see him maturing even more growing more and more in the knowledge of the word, whereby the preaching and teaching actually matures, whereby he gets better at shepherding. And there's a basic principle at play here. Invisible discipline has observable growth. When you walk with Christ, even though it's not your intention to let everyone else know how amazing you are, or godly, or whatever it is, that's not your intention. If you sound like the problem, but the thing is, if you sound like Jesus, if you talk like Jesus, if you act like Jesus, even though it's not your intention to tell people how godly you are, they will see it. People are not going to ignore that. They will see it. And that is what must be happening in your life, Timothy. You must grow in your pastoral work. And when you grow, people will notice, and hopefully they'll be inspired to grow as well. When they see you speak like Jesus, they'll be inspired to speak like Jesus themselves. When they see you act like Him, and hopefully think like Him, they will be inspired to do that as well. The success of pastor's life is not one whereby there's a constant spiritual U-turn in his life. It's one whereby he's slowly being transformed, slowly progressing more and more into the image of Christ. And that takes us to the final aspect of what it means to be a successful pastor. The successful pastor has the right priorities. Let's look at the final verse. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things, for as you do this, you will ensure salvation, both for yourself and for those who hear you. And this final verse is probably a good summary of what has just been said, uh, so I don't want to belabor the point. Paul ends by telling Timothy to pay close attention, or to hold fast, or as the King James Version says, take heed. What must Timothy take heed to? To himself and to his teaching. Timothy, it all comes down to this. If you want to be a successful pastor, it's really about two things. Your own personal walk with Jesus and your teaching ministry. If you can't remember anything else, remember these two because I summarized everything I've already said. Pay close attention to the way you live, to your speech, to your actions, to your thoughts. Don't forget about the power that a godly pastoral life can have in a church, Timothy. Also, don't neglect your teaching. Don't get swayed by every wind of doctrine, but hold fast to the faithful word. And both of these priorities of being a pastor have obviously been under attack since Paul wrote these words. And today is no exception. Today we have pastors who are trying to attempt to be cool. Let me just tell you, you'll never be cool as a pastor. You'll never be cool. Just, just telling you, you'll never be cool. You can try act like it, but you'll never be. Today we have pastors in attempting to be cool have instead acted, acted foolishly by acting like kids. The world doesn't need kids behind the pulpit. 
They don't. Pastors mustn't try to be hip. Must dress like a man. Don't try to dress like a kid. Must be act like a man. Grow up. There are plenty of childish men in this world that we don't need to add any more to them. The world needs godly men who have prioritized their lives, who are pursuing godliness, not coolness. When people see you as a pastor, it's not about, they don't, they don't, they don't need you see your, how hip or groovy you are, whatever other words people use these days. That's why I'm not cool. I don't know any new words. People don't need to see your groovy haircuts or your cool shades. What they need is a, need is a person who can imitate Jesus in their life. And then they can imitate their life as they imitate Christ. They need a person who is persevering in the faith, pursuing holiness. That's what they need. They need pastors who are paying close attention to themselves. Also, they need pastors who are paying close attention to their teaching. Pastors, people are looking at pastors to help them understand God's Word. They mustn't neglect that task. Because if they don't do it, the people will be carried around, like I said, by every wind of doctrine. Ephesians 4, that's why God said He gave certain people to the church. So they wouldn't be carried around by every wind of doctrine. One way you can tell the teaching level of a pastor is by the theological growth of the church. A congregation who is swept to and fro by every wind of doctrine is usually a congregation that hasn't been taught well. But a congregation that has a strong conviction in the theological truths we see in the scriptures, that's a congregation that has been well taught. Kent Hughes, he says again, he warns his readers about the danger of what he has seen in many pulpits around the world. This danger he calls disexposition. And he, he describes his preaching this way. He says the congregation hears the text read, and they wait in anticipation for its exposition, only to be disappointed when the text is never alluded to in the next 30 minutes. Or more commonly, the text is handled superficially with no serious engagement of its meaning. The preacher mouths its words, but there's no substance. This exposition takes many forms. Sometimes the text is so encrusted with stories and jokes that the text is unseen and unheard. Other times it is distorted because it is preached through a therapeutic, political or social lens. Paul calls young Timothy to be radically biblical in his preaching, expositional. And then to close off this chapter, Paul tells Timothy the result of him persevering in these two things. For as you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. The result of a successful pastor is this. You will ensure salvation both for yourself and for your hearers. Now the word salvation is simply a word that can mean to save or rescue. And while most times in the scriptures it refers to someone's actual salvation, sometimes it refers to something else. It doesn't always refer to coming to faith. Sometimes it refers to one's sanctification. And we know that that's the case here because how can save Timothy's result of his pastoral work be that he will be saved? Isn't he already saved? Additionally, that would imply that we could merit someone else's salvation. That's very Roman Catholic. So I think the idea here is not salvific but more about sanctification. His point is this. Those who persevere in life and the doctrine will persevere in salvation. They will grow in their walk. And when you persevere, it encourages others to do as well. When you live as a good example, as he said, so will others. When you live for Christ, so will others. Live for Jesus too. And so overall, we have seen 11, if you add the last sermon on this, we have seen 11 traits or aspects of what it means to be a successful pastor. And so if you're looking for a church, whether now or in the future, you need to look at the leadership. Are they excelling in these traits? If they are, jump into that church. If they're not, keep looking. Keep looking for the church whose leaders are resembling Jesus Christ in His conduct and in His teaching. That's what you need to look for. That is what a successful pastor is. Robert Murray McShane knew it. And hopefully we do as well now. Let's pray. Mighty God, we are thankful for this chapter 4 that you have blessed us with in 1 Timothy. A chapter about the pastoral ministry. And we're great, grateful that as we go through it, we can learn many truths that you had wanted us to know. So I just pray that you would continue to guide all of us to more Christ-likeness. That we would be more holy as you are holy. That, you would be more, that we would be more Christ-like. We would resemble Jesus more and more. We need you to help us do it. And so as we read your word, we pray that your word would do the change in our hearts.
today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.